I never imagined that I would be a bishop. The pathway that I've traveled isn't the conventional one. In some respects, the job I hold is actually undoable. 250,000 people are homeless. There are huge expectations. An increase in forced migration. Everybody you speak to probably has different expectations. Deeply troubling conditions. So I will never fulfill. As the Church of England's lead bishop for housing. Acknowledging that is a release. I can only do what I can do. How to do this when you're a minority who is fearful for your existence? The crux of faith is that God loves us not because of what we do or because of what we achieve, but simply because of who we are. My parents were both people of deep and profound faith who've had a huge influence and continue to have an influence on me. How it's possible to see good things come out of very dark circumstances. Everything that is interesting is 90% boring. My Lords, I was introduced to the House barely a month ago, having recently taken up my post as Bishop of Chelmsford, at that vast and wonderful diocese that covers the whole of Essex and East London. I come myself originally from Iran. I'm kind of surrounded by things that are reminders of different times in my life. This is a Persian cross. That's the Lord's Prayer in Persian. I left as a teenager during the Islamic Revolution and following difficult and traumatic circumstances. That was the Bishop's house in Iran. That's where I grew up. Properties were confiscated, financial assets frozen. One of our clergy was murdered in his study. And my father, who was by then bishop of the church, was briefly imprisoned before an attack on his life. In May 1980, my 24-year-old brother was shot in the head and he died instantly. No arrests were ever made, no court case followed, no explanation offered for his murder. My vocational journey began with a very simple question. Things weren't quite working out as I imagined in my life or was wanting, so I simply was asking God the question, what is it you want of me? If not this, then what is it? People view religion often as just a series of do's and don'ts. That's not what it is for me. It's about um, developing a relationship with the person we call God. Faith is about something that connects us to, to the big and the beyond life and, you know, life after death and all that. But actually faith is also very much about believing in life before death and trying to be a part of improving the situation in, in people's lives. That's, that's why for me we have to be political with a small p because we're about people's lives. In all honesty, the, the question of, of how much influence do I have, uh, I, I don't know. I say that within the context of a church which has lost a lot of influence. You know, we, we don't have the, the central place in society that we once did. There's a lot of fear in the church that we're going to die out soon, that we're, we're not going to exist. I'm not of that view. I think that things are changing. We may be more marginal, but the margins are good. The margins are okay. You, you can have quite a lot of um, impact from the margins. I, I suppose I've been heavily influenced in that through my background and my upbringing. The church had, uh, over a period of 100 years or so, developed into a good institution. We had schools, we had hospitals, you know, there was good work going on. And then suddenly, as a result of the revolution, all that was stripped away. My parents, in a sense, everything that they'd worked for and, and lived for, had failed, in human terms had failed. But for me, the miracle is that the church is still in Iran. Um, it is small, but actually the 40 years, which is a lifetime for me, 
is a blink of an eye in terms of the scope of history. I try for my posture to be one of openness and uh, always expect that there are new things to learn and understand. Lots of people you know, have had challenging circumstances or feel that they're marginal for all kinds of reasons. And so the opportunity is to, to make connections and to build on our common stories. It's a rather undignified place for it at the minute, but this is the, I don't know. My bishop's staff, which is the, again a symbol that all bishops have, the shepherd's crook. It was originally my dad's, but in his old age, he, he, he sawed the bottom of it off uh, and used it as a walking stick. And so when I became a bishop, my husband had it uh, restored with a new bit of wood, um, but the top of it and the crook itself is my dad's. And I find that to be a very powerful symbol for me, that I am my own unique person. I am who I am. Um, but through this metal cuff on which are written the words, feed my sheep, um, I'm also connected, um, not just to my own father and my own family, but to the church in Iran and to, to the church in all time and place. So this is the new bit of wood um, attached on to, to the old. and symbolic for all of us, I think, of both our individuality and our interconnectedness. I'll begin every day with, it might just be 15, 20 minutes of reading, um, and then 10, 15 minutes of silent contemplative prayer, which has become increasingly important for me, uh, and then saying the morning office, morning prayer. Um, so the whole thing may last somewhere between 40, 40 minutes to an hour, and it's on which everything else is built. This is where I come every morning, yeah. We've moved the bins now to back onto this wall. They used to be bang opposite. So much of our lives are about words, but we do very little listening. Uh, and so for me, the real prayer begins at that point when I try to silence the noises in my own head and just in that moment to dwell on God's presence, God's call on my life. It's very difficult, but all I can say is that over time, over the years that I've been doing it, it has given me deep within me a, a sense of growing peacefulness and, uh, and, and calm uh, and proportion and perspective. Life existed before me and life will exist after me. I think of the role more in terms of who I am and what relationships I need to form rather than the specifics of what I do. How I often think of it is not so much about having a vision and a strategy, it's about trying to determine the direction of travel. Clergy will often talk about the sense of isolation that they feel. It can be quite a lonely role. Often clergy will get very little affirmation um, from the people that they serve, from their congregations, from their communities. And so we can be left wondering, you know, what is, what is my purpose? Am I fulfilling God's call on my life? So I think one of my roles is to try and ensure that clergy feel valued, that they feel appreciated, that they know that they're prayed for. I suppose the way I try to address the whole area of management is to get to know the team that I work with most closely. I will make myself available to, to listen and to have a conversation uh, and that if we can get that right then they will be energised and enabled to do that for the people that they then have most contact with and so on and so forth so that it cascades out. There's a lot of pressure I think on young people to know what they want to do from a really early age. I think that's a shame. We only live life once. There is space for exploring and uh, trial and error, uh, but I think the challenge is to not necessarily get drawn by the ideas of earthly success. I wonder 
whether those who are drawn purely by financial benefit or, or uh, lifestyle or um, things that will bring worldly praise, as it were. I don't begrudge anybody their, their wealth or their power or their influence, but those things, in my experience, don't necessarily bring satisfaction. In the end, satisfaction comes from a deeper sense of finding our purpose in life uh, and having relationships that sustain us. Um, that might be in a job that happens to pay a lot and provide you know, um, certain benefits, or it might not be. The root of joy and happiness is not found, in my experience, in worldly success, but in, in the deeper things of life. Iran is a land with a rich culture. It has produced some of the greatest poets, architects, artists, and scientists over its long and distinguished history. And British civilization too is built on principles of compassion, tolerance and justice. These are thoroughly British values from which I and many other refugees, immigrants and asylum seekers have benefited over the years. My lords, it is better for the soul of this nation to treat people with the greatest possible respect and dignity rather than with hostility and doubt.